Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, there we go, rolling. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 19. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Before we get into the heart of today's program, which is going to be about the work-life balance for a documentary filmmaker, or at least how to try and achieve that, I wanted to share some thoughts that I've been having lately post-election time here in the U.S. And I have to tell you that I went back and forth about talking about this talking about my feelings about the election, mostly because I didn't want to alienate any of my listeners, but also because I don't want this to be about politics. I want to remain true to the intent of this show, which is to help educate and inspire people about this shared passion that we all have, documentary filmmaking. That being said, I also realize that a big part of what I try to be on this show is to be real, for me and for you. It is my belief that without this sort of intimacy, without this authenticity, I risk simply sounding like any other radio show or podcast that maybe is afraid to take risks, or worse, is intentionally vanilla for fear of losing listeners, and therefore losing sponsorships or commercial value. That's just not me. Yes, of course, I want to at some point in the near future be generating some kind of revenue with TDL, but not at the risk of my authenticity or at the risk of my listeners benefiting from the content or inspirational aspects of this show. That being said, this show is a show that I think is also best served by being open to all ways of thinking, to all cultures, without intentional bias to religion, country, etc. There is absolutely no room on this show for sexism, racism, homophobia, or xenophobia, of course, but I want this show, within reason, to remain open to all forms of constructive thought and opinions. Not unlike what we do as documentary filmmakers, I want to learn about ways of thinking, ways of living that are not simply the way that I think or the way that I live my life, or maybe beliefs that I might be, quite honestly, pretty uncomfortable with. As many of you know, I currently reside in Portland, Oregon, here in the USA. If you don't already have some idea about Portland, well, I, I, I'll just say it's one of the most progressive-thinking, liberal-minded places in the U.S. Protests and marches are practically a weekly experience here. Good, clean food sources are a way of life. Cities from around the world model their public transport systems from Portland's famous TriMet system. Biking is not just a recreation, it is quite literally the preferred method of transport for a huge percentage of people, come rain, snow, or shine. In fact, I was amazed at the amount of people still making the trek to work on bike, even though we recently had a foot of snow on the ground. The amount of exercise that people engage in in this town is extraordinary. People run, people bike, people snowboard, people play futsal. And if you don't know what futsal is, you should definitely look it up. Anyhow, so living in Portland, Oregon, for many people, it's a really pretty amazing lifestyle. It's why people have been moving here in droves over the past decade. Now, the downside to this is that you tend to have a pretty distorted view of how Americans think. 
when George W. Bush won the presidency the first time out, we here in P-Town, if you will, were all pretty shocked. Didn't make sense. Didn't compute at all. I remember being in Cambodia, eating lunch in a tiny shack where somehow they managed to have rigged some sort of a, a satellite TV up, and the BBC was showing election results, and we were stunned by them. We simply didn't know anyone back home in Portland that had voted for Bush. The same happened this time out with Trump, where something like only 17.6% of Portland voted for him. What this means is that regardless of how strong our beliefs, we were truly only hearing one voice, our own. We were reading the same newspapers, watching the same kinds of documentaries, listening to NPR, discussing the same types of leftist politics, at the very least willingly engaging with Americans that thought like us. Which will finally lead to my point in all this. Thank you for bearing with me. Recently, I've gotten some emails and texts from listeners and colleagues and friends who have been wondering about the state of the world these days. Certainly, in my crowd, there has been a lot of sadness. There has been some shock and certainly fear about where many of us think things are headed, whether it be here in the U.S. or in the U.K., where my wife and her family are from, now living in a Brexit and Trump world. And in the case of my listeners, many are wondering or commenting on the place of documentary amidst all of this. On the last show, you'll remember, I had a shared conversation with professional storyteller and author Joel Ben Izzy. If you haven't listened to it yet, I'd encourage you to go back and check it out. It's episode number 18, and it can be found by going to the, the website, thedocumentarylife.com, or, or by going to Stitcher or iTunes and searching for The Documentary Life. In the show, amongst other things, Joel mentions that it's, quote, impossible to hate someone once you've heard their story. Now, that line really struck me and hit home on many levels, and I knew and, and secretly hoped that it would for many of my listeners. There's just something so acute, real, and so appropriate these days to be taken from that single statement. Again, it's impossible to hate someone once you've heard their story. So sure enough, the other night I received a text message from a friend and colleague of mine, Nancy, who is an interpreter. In fact, I met Nancy and mutual friend and colleague Tom on an annual gig that we all do for a company called Sustainable Harvest. I've mentioned sustainable in the I've mentioned sustainable in these gigs abroad a few times on the show. At any rate, Nancy had messaged both Tom and I referencing that very powerful quote from Joel, "It's impossible to hate someone once you've heard their story." Now, something that you need to understand about Nancy, and I don't think she'd be upset about me saying this, is that she's pretty vocal about her progressive and liberal views. She lives and is based out of Washington, D.C. Politics is quite literally a way of life there, and people talk about politics with the same amount of passion and fervor and frequency that many people talk about football. Nancy goes on to write, At a time of such hate and division in our country, world, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, Perhaps we should organize storytelling sessions around the country amongst people across the political, social, and geographical spectrum. So when Nancy had written this to me, I knew something had shifted within her, that some things had been shifting within me. There was this recognition, and it's something that I've been feeling a lot of lately myself, that we all need to be dialoguing more with people that we might not normally dialogue with. There's an increasing need for all of us to be extending ourselves a bit, reaching out and engaging with people we might not normally be accustomed to engaging with, in an effort to not only try and understand where one another is coming from, but also in an effort to try and find some common ground in which we can then hopefully move forward in a more constructive and loving manner. There will always be haters. There will always be extremists. But you know what? They're just cashing in and exploiting those of us who maybe have been wronged by someone or feel fear by someone who believes differently than we do. But I'm going to tell you, the hate, the vitriol, the assumptions, the mudslinging over social media platforms, well, for 99% of us, that is simply not working. The only thing that it's doing is driving us farther and farther apart from any sort of commonality. And if you don't see the commonality within all of us, if you don't see the connectedness that we all have as human beings inhabiting the same small place called Earth, well then hate and negativity wins. So as documentary filmmakers, don't we perhaps owe it to ourselves to get out there and start telling the stories of others? 
I mean, I think that many of us naturally do this, of course. Anyhow, we're all out there as as explorers, as past guest and doc filmmaker Ian McCluskey once described. We tend to get out and try and tell the stories that are maybe less heard. I certainly do with my work in Southeast Asian cultures. It's a big part of why I tell the stories of these cultures. To learn something for myself and to share that knowledge with an audience in hopes of opening minds and hearts up to the zillions of ways that people live here on this planet. Going back to what Joel said about not being able to hate someone once you've heard their story, think of how many documentary films that you've watched where in the end, regardless of the character being a convicted, maybe a convicted felon, a murderer, a terrorist, whatever, once you heard their story, once you had some context of where they came from, like say who their parents were, the religion that was a part of their upbringing, the slums that they grew up in, the influences they were exposed to, the parents they didn't have, or the parents who were convicted of a hate crime themselves. Once you have some understanding of this, you can start to see the human side of a person. Maybe even any person. I guess that what I'm saying here is that if you aren't already, make sure that you do get out there and you're mixing things up a little bit. Maybe getting uncomfortable and dialoguing with people you wouldn't normally do so with. Listen to them. Don't preach your own views. Just listen. And then maybe, once they've been heard, try and explain where you come from, why you think the way in which you do. And then, let all of this conversation inform your documentaries. Let it inspire you to share the stories that come from these conversations. I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing some amazing documentary films over the next handful of years that are going to open a lot of hearts and minds. And I have a feeling that some of these films are going to come from you. Make it happen, Doc Lifers. There are plenty of places online to learn how to do things like split the audio signals coming into your camera, or how to animate some of your still photos, or get some great tips on lighting your interview, many blogs, YouTube videos, and of course podcasts where you can quickly grab an answer to a tech-related question. But what if there was one place where you could learn from beginning to end how to make a documentary film and how to become a doc filmmaker, how to raise money and build an audience for your doc, how to form strategic partnerships and launch your doc out into the world, and perhaps even, if you can imagine, make some money from it? Well, there is such a place, and it's called the Documentary Academy. Steph and I took two years to build out this comprehensive resource that takes you step by step from story creation and pre-production all the way to post-production, launch, and distribution. The Academy takes you through your doc filmmaking journey as your most confident, active, strategic, creative, focused, and articulate self. It is a step-by-step -step guide to empowerment in the documentary filmmaking world. We know what we have in the Documentary Academy. Now it's up to you to discover what you have as a doc filmmaker. Do that today by heading over to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. So this idea of finding some sort of balance in our professional and personal lives, it's something that we've all been hearing for years, right? Whether it be from our friends, our spouses, our therapists, whether it be from books that we've read, there's practically a section on this now, right? In the bookstore, TV programs that we've watched, news reports that we've heard about, we've all at some point heard about the virtues of achieving some kind of work-life balance in our daily lives. Now, this is made a little complicated for us doc lifers, who oftentimes are not only balancing our personal lives with our professional lives, but also with our passion lives, that is, our documentary lives. I mean, the very name of this podcast is reflective of our constant striving to find what we refer to on this show as a documentary life. Because often the paid work that we're doing may be separate from our documentary work, we have to separate these two items out, right? For instance, as you know, the vast majority of my income does not currently come from documentary. It comes from doing commercial spots and corporate video gigs. The documentary work, currently our project Elvis of Cambodia, is, it, is an entirely separate thing. So I, like most of us, have to consider the paid work the documentary work, and our personal lives is all very distinct aspects to our lives that we must consider when trying to work out this, this balance. And speaking of aspects, what are the aspects of life that are often affected when we don't have this balance that we're talking about? 
if we're working 60 plus hour weeks, there are some major assets that can be directly affected. What are they? Well, the first things you know that are generally impacted by this type of imbalance are your health, your family, your friendships, your marriage. Those are just to name a few that come off the top of the head. Take this past week, for example. I worked a string of four-day shoot days on an infomercial that were on average after the workday and then travel to and from location 15 plus hour days. Do the math. That's 60 hours in four days time. That's a lot for anybody and especially someone with a family. Now, it just so happens that my family is not here this week. They're with Steph's family in the UK. So the professional life, it didn't impact my family life, my personal life per se, but the imbalance certainly still had its ramifications on me in a health sense. After that intense shoot, I was practically useless for the next two days. As I put together this podcast, it's day three removed from the shoot, and I'm only now feeling remotely human again. Any of you who have ever worked on a shoot like this know that, that it can be a bit of a come down coming back to, and I put in quotes, normal life. Being on location, working with cast and crew, doing these long hours, all with a common goal, well, it, it has an effect on you. It's an intense experience where often you, you almost forget that there is any other life outside of what you are all currently experiencing at that time. My wife, Steph, she can speak to this better than much better than I can since the majority of her work experience has been working on feature films whereas I've mainly worked in commercial and documentary and features are often working four to eight weeks at a time doing these 12 to 15 hour days and I don't know about you but when my body is tired my emotional state is directly connected to it I've learned over the years that I actually have to be careful how I communicate and function out in the normal world, again, normal in, in quotes, once I've gotten off of, you know, a longer shoot or I've returned, you know, for example, from a trip overseas where maybe the time adjustment is extreme. From experience, I know now better about how I can be during these times, which is quite often, well, I'm very sensitive to the world around me. I'm, look, I'm already a pretty sensitive dude by nature, but when my body is taxed like that, even more so. And I can often react in a way that is reflective of that. I can give you a pretty extreme example of this, but it's a good one. Years ago, and I haven't told this to many people, years ago, in fact, I'm years enough removed from this happening that I think it's okay to talk about now. Years ago, when I was, when I was first te- you know, starting out in the commercial industry and working as a production assistant, as a PA, I was asked about an availability on a job. At the time, I was in Southeast Asia doing some dock work and, and traveling about. So I'd been out of the country for a few weeks. Most most likely hadn't worked in at least a month's time. So I needed the work. You know, I could, I could, could have certainly used it. It just so happened that they were asking me to the work the day after, um, the day after getting back from my trip. In other words, I would have zero time to decompress and let my mind and, and body get back on a proper time schedule before having to jump into any kind of work. I would quite literally be operating on a 15-hour time difference. But because I needed the work, I took the job, figuring it was only for a couple of days, and then I'd be able to push through it. Well, on that second day on the job, I was driving a two-ton truck for the art department. I was making a pickup in the middle of the city at the height of the workday. And on that second day, not only was my body totally wiped out from the time change and the trip, but I was actually getting very sick and quickly at that. The last thing I should have been doing was driving a two-ton truck around anywhere at any time, let alone downtown Portland during rush hour. Make a long story short, after making the pickup, I took a turn a little too quickly. I didn't judge the distance very correctly when I was trying to get back out into traffic, and I clipped a parked car, a Prius, that was in front of me. At the same time, the commuter train, the aforementioned TriMet system, the commuter train was coming down the streets and my truck was halfway into the tracks. I panicked and I kept pulling forward, even though I knew I'd already clipped the Prius and maybe was still touching it. Well, I was certainly still mm, touching it, as as I were to quickly discover. The whole side of the car ripped straight up. The Prius now looked like, it looked like a DeLorean. You know the DeLorean? <laughs> you know where the, the doors open straight upwards? Only it wasn't a DeLorean. It was a Prius. And Prius doors don't generally open up like this. Worst day as a PA in my life. 
Imagine having to call the producer and explain that not only were you going to be late arriving to set with the furniture that you just picked up, but that you'd been in an accident that was now going to cost the production company probably thousands of dollars in damage. Yeah, needless to say, I never worked for that company again. Now, I'm pretty sure that if I hadn't been sick or so damn tired, I would have made some better decisions that day. I most likely wouldn't have hit the car in front of me, or at the very least, I wouldn't have panicked and kept moving forward, thereby making an instant DeLorean out of a poor little Prius. So yes, maybe extreme example of how things can go wrong when one doesn't have balance in their work life, but maybe it's not until these extreme moments happen that we make their necessary changes that need to be made in our lives. So hopefully, the following suggestions that I'm about to give you can help you achieve some better balance in your own documentary lives. I'm going to give you three distinct suggestions. Number one, get real about your priorities. This may seem like a no-brainer, but it's often not as easy as one would think. In fact, sometimes it's actually easier when we have so many things on our plate to shift on a daily basis, sometimes hourly basis, what we think our priorities are. And when we're constantly shifting what our priorities are, we risk things getting done in a half-assed, less than satisfactory manner. Because we're really not focused on one thing, because we quickly get distracted by focusing on something else, then something else, and then something else, we don't ever really get things done in a satisfactory manner, if they even ever get done at all. Just think about how many times you started that house project that you've been thinking on for a long time. Let's go with repainting the kids' bedrooms. But then, then you get consumed with taking the kids to their band practice, having to go back to work, getting groceries for the week, downloading the latest firmware for your camera, any number of things, right? And then you end up with a room with some blue tape around the walls, half of it actually painted, half empty paint cam sitting in the corner of the room for who knows how long. Don't pretend that this hasn't happened to you, or at least something analogous to it. We all do it, or we all have done it at one time or another. But what can really truly help with this is deciding what is priority in your life and then sticking to those things, refusing to get distracted by the minutia of life that will inevitably always come up. Let's face it, there's always going to be other things to distract you, other things that call you away from your priorities. But at the end of the day, it's up to you to decide what's really going to command your attention. So make a list right now. Or maybe not right this second, but maybe shortly after listening to the program. List out three to five of the most important things in your life that you should be giving your energies and attention to. What are the three to five priorities in your life? And list them in order of importance. And again, you have to be real about this. You have to be honest with yourself. Don't just list out what you think should be priorities or what you think your parent or teacher, or boss, or spouse would think your priority should be. It has to come from you. It has to come from your own heart, right? Otherwise, you won't make it a priority. For some of you, it might be family. For some of you, it might be religion. It might be God. Or it might even, it might be making money. I can share with you what one of my priorities is. And honestly, it's one of my top priorities. And many of you may initially, when you hear this, you might think it's pretty selfish. One of my top priorities is me. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Wow, man, that's really grand of you, Chris, to make yourself a priority. (laughs) But bear with me for a minute, and I'll explain what I mean by this. Here's my thinking. If I am not in a good, healthy space, right? If I'm not taking good care of my health, both physical and mental, then I'm not going to be able to best provide for my family, right? If I am not healthy... I cannot provide a healthy space for my wife and children. And believe me, I don't mind sharing that I'm not quite there yet. I'm working on it. A lot. And probably more so now than ever before since we have a 3-year-old and a 10-month-old. And therefore, you know, I recognize the pressing need for it. But I I certainly still have a way to go, right? Sure, it's easy for me right now to work my butt off doing 15-hour days for days in a row or work on the podcast as much as I want whenever I want or work on Elvis from morning to night, but I'm not directly affecting Steph or the kids because they're in the UK at the moment, right? As I mentioned earlier. So when I'm not feeling well because I'm exhausted, I can just, you know, curl up on the couch and take a break and not have to worry about anyone else. 
However, of course, that's not normally my life. Normally, my life is, of course, with Steph and the kids. So when I do get too tired or I don't eat too well and and I get ill, that directly impacts my life and the family's life negatively. Suddenly, Steph might have to do three times the work she normally does just to pick up the slack from me, right? Which then just puts added weight and pressure onto her. Or vice versa, if Steph gets run down, which quite frankly happens a lot with two kids and no one to help us with them, then I have to pick up the slack, which then puts me at an energy deficit. Honestly, we're constantly doing this to one another, shifting the loads back and forth. And believe me, this is not balance. This is not healthy. Hence, us making you know a big move soon from the West Coast of the United States to where we have zero family to the UK where she has family. And I'm in some ways closer to my family who all live in New York State on the East Coast. Now, forgive me if I got a little too personal there, but you know I wanted to share with you how not having balance in one's life can actually quite seriously negatively impact not only your life, but others' lives. So to come back around to what I was saying, I have chosen to make me a priority in a very intentional fashion. And Steph is doing the same thing, making herself her priority. We've actually spent a lot of time talking about this. So, you know, we do this so as to positively impact our work and family around us. Our own health and well-being, we have come to learn, directly affects the health and the well-being of our family. Moving on to the next item that will help you achieve some balance in your work slash life slash doc life. And this follows on from the priorities item. Number two, course correction. The ability to course correct. Why this is absolutely necessary is that your priorities will change. Not all of them, sure, but most likely some of them. What may be priorities for you now may not be priorities for you later on, and most likely weren't priorities for you a few years back. Up until three years ago, I didn't have my own family, so family wasn't a priority for me, right? Up until four years ago, I didn't own a house. It wasn't a priority at all, owning a house. In fact, what was a priority for me the eight years prior to that was living in a studio apartment, a place with very low overhead and not much space for that matter, which might have allowed me, you know, that would have allowed me to accumulate things, which I was not, which I was trying not to do. But again, a place with very low overhead, which would allow me to travel and do work overseas, sometimes for weeks at a time, without having to worry much about making monthly ends meet. That was a very conscious decision that I made to live in a way that would allow me to travel and film documentaries overseas. Now, in 2012, my priorities shifted a little bit, maybe even more than a little bit. While I still wanted the flexibility to be able to travel and do work overseas, I also wanted to come back to more of a home base. I wanted a slightly bigger space that was, well, quite frankly, just a little more inhabitable for my cat and I. And when I started looking at the rental market in Portland and saw how much rent had skyrocketed, well, I then decided to investigate what a mortgage might look like since the numbers just weren't that dissimilar to what Portland rent was apparently now commanding. Lo and behold, I found out that I could own a house for even less than what I might pay for an apartment. So suddenly my priorities shifted, right? My my priority went into buying a house, though being cognizant of getting something affordable enough that it would still allow me to take off for weeks at a time and practice my passion. So priorities can and will shift in your life. The key here is to allow for that to happen. Recognize that it's a natural thing, this shifting in needs and priorities. Maybe a good thing to do is to check in with yourself on a fairly regular basis. Revisit your priorities list. I try and do this twice a year. Some people do it quarterly, like their taxes. Others maybe even do it weekly. It all just kind of depends on what's happening in our lives, how quickly it's happening, who it's happening with. Like when I met Steph and then we started to have a family, for example. I have a good friend who biannually goes into the desert or wilderness to reconnect with himself. He literally removes himself from work, family, and friends. All distractions like his phone or email and goes out and meditates on his life. What's working, what isn't, and comes up with a plan for moving forward over the next six months. Like clockwork, he does this activity. Now, there may or may not be psychotropic drugs involved here, but to each his own, right? For the kids at home who may be listening, I, of course, cannot, shall we say, sanction this last part, but you get what I'm saying here. I'm not suggesting that you go out to the desert and do some peyote and strut around like you're the Lizard King. But I do see the merit in taking some time with oneself to reconnect and reassess one's life priorities. 
The third and final suggestion that I have to help you maintain some sort of balance in your documentary lives is scheduling time to do these things that you are committed to. Unless you're some uber-motivated genius, finding all the time to do all the priorities that you have is damn near impossible unless you have it scheduled out. Trying to keep in your head all the things that you want and need to be done in your life is a ridiculous pursuit. You're setting yourself up for failure. If you're anything like me, trying to juggle your work, play, creative pursuits, family life is a futile pursuit. It's hard enough trying to remember all of the smaller everyday events in life, like you know, to pick your kid up from baseball practice, or to send some important work files to a client, or to charge camera batteries the night before of a shoot. It's also very time consuming, all of these things. So when you try and put bigger ticket items to your life, like these priorities, you have to have something written down. Whether you do these things by hand in a planner, or as my British wife calls it, your diary, you know, or you put them in Google Calendar, you must find a place that you can return to, not only to make sure you keep to your schedule, but also to hold you accountable to your priorities. Here's what I do. And by the way, I want to be completely forthcoming with this. This, this, this part is not my idea at all. Now, I'm not 100% sure of where I got it from, might be from uh, a self-help speaker who I've referenced before on the show, Brian Tracy. I've just been doing it for so long. It's just, it's something, it's become something that I do, right? I don't really remember where I got it from. But what it is, is this. I like to create a goal list of maybe eight to 10 items and they must fall into, into the priorities. They have to fall into your priorities. This goal list not only contains the goal itself, but it also contains a time frame for when the goal must be completed. And it's also written in a very affirmative kind of verbiage, acting as if it's already happened. Many of you probably recognize this as a pretty common trick when doing any kind of uh, a visualization. So for example, one day I woke up and realized I'd been working on my Nepal doc, Journey to Kathmandu, for nearly four years. And that it was high time to just get the damn thing done. So I set a date for when I wanted the film to actually be shown to the public, its premiere date, if you will, right? I set it for six months out. When I wrote it down, I didn't say, I wish to have the film done in six months. No, I left no room for doubt or interpretation. I was exact and I was very affirmative. I wrote down, in July, Journey, Journey to Kathmandu premieres at the Hollywood Theater. I did this sort of visualizing with about 10 items, created my list of goals, again, all based on my, on my priorities. And then, and this, is, and this is important, I did this every morning when I woke up. It was the way I started the day. I would rewrite the list on the next page. And the next day, I'd write the list on the next page. Pretty quickly, the list was just in my mind as I wrote it every day. I never had to, you know, look back on the previous, on the previous page to see what I'd written. In essence, my goals were not only constantly in my mind, even if, even if subconsciously, but they all had very specific time frames to them. And sure enough, I would soon start ticking off my goals one by one. I'm not just saying this. This is not some self-help BS that I read, though I think we've already established that I did read it somewhere. But this thing has worked wonders for me. It's as if by the mind thinking these things and your hand consistently writing them out every day, you start to make these things happen. And maybe more appropriately, you refuse to let, let them not happen, right? You refuse to let yourself down when you're consistently and constantly reminding yourself of what remains to be done. I literally got myself out of credit card debt, completed a documentary film, got my first job directing a commercial, bought my first house, all in this fashion. They were all at one time or another a part of my goals list, which of course came from them being priorities. So that's it. Those are the three suggestions that I think can help you achieve a better balance in your own documentary lives, which again is your work life, the paid gigs, your personal life, family and friends, and your creative life, your documentaries. Now, I'd be willing to bet that you have come up with some of your own ways to stay on target, and I'd like to hear them. Not only so that I may learn from your experiences, but also so that I may share them with the rest of our community. So drop me an email or go to the website and leave some comments there. My email address is chris at barongfilms.com. C-H-R-I-S, chris at B-A-R-A-N-G films.com. The website for the podcast is thedocumentarylife.com. 
And I'd invite you to start checking the website regularly as I'll always post some show notes that will align you know, with the current show topic. I'm also going to start blogging in between weeks of a new show. So start looking for some Documentary Life content to be going up there as well. I'll also mention some of the the Documentary Life social media platforms like Instagram and Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram at the underscore documentary underscore life and on Twitter by going to at my doc life. Before I go, I want to let you know about our next show, which will come out on February 17th. It's our second Doc Industry Guest of the Year, and his name is Justin Shine. Justin is shot on over 60 films internationally for the likes of the BBC, the Discovery Channel, and PBS. His documentary film No Impact Man premiered at Sundance in 2009 and has screened throughout the world. Through his company Shadowbox Films, he is set to release his latest documentary feature, Left on Purpose, a film about Mayor Vishner, a man who may be the most important 1960s American radical, you've never heard of. He was the unsung hero behind the Yippie movement. This film starts off as the story about an anti-war activist, but quickly becomes something drastically different when midway through filming, Vishner declares that his time has passed and that as his last political act, he will be committing suicide. Director Shine is forced to make the decision between turning off his camera or keeping it on in order to keep his friend alive. I've seen the film. It's very good. And I'm eager to talk with Justin about some very serious issues of ethics that come up during the filming of Left on Purpose. I imagine there's going to be some really interesting discussion had here. So be sure to download the episode when it comes up in two weeks time. Thanks for listening, everyone, and for making the Documentary Life podcast something that I truly look forward to bringing to you every other week. Until next time, I remain your host and fellow doc lifer, Chris G. Parkhurst. So long. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.